Chapter 2 of Wittershins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by C.J. Casey. Wittershins by Oliver Onions. Chapter 2. Fantas. For, barring all pother, with this or the other, still Britons are lords of the main. The Chapter of Admirals. 1. As Abel Keeling lay on the galleon's deck, held from rolling down it only by his own weight and the sun-blackened hand that lay outstretched upon the planks his gaze wandered but ever returned to the bell that hung jammed with a dangerous heel over the vessel and the small ornamental belfry immediately abaft the mainmast the bell was of cast bronze with half obliterated bosses upon it that had been the heads of cherubs but wind and salt spray had given it a thick incrustation of bright beautiful lichenous green it was this color that abel keeling's eyes liked for wherever else on the galleon his eyes rested they found only whiteness the whiteness of extreme eld there were slightly varying degrees in her whiteness here she was of a white that glistened like salt granules there of a grayish chalky white and again her whiteness had the yellowish cast of decay but everywhere it was the mild disquieting whiteness of materials out of which the life had departed her cordage was bleached as old straw is bleached and half her ropes kept their shape little more firmly than the ash of a string keeps its shape after the fire is passed her pallid timbers were white and clean as bones found in sand and even the wild frankincense with which for lack of tar at her last touching of land she had been pitched had dried to a pale hard gum that sparkled like quartz in her open seams the sun was yet so pale a buckler of silver through the still white mists that not a cord or timber cast a shadow and only abel keeling's face and hands were black carked and cinder black from exposure to his pitiless rays the gallium was the mary of the tower and she had a frightful list to starboard so canted was she that her mainyard dipped one of its steel sickles into the glassy water and had a foremast remain or more than the broken stump of a bonaventure midson she must have turned over completely many days ago they had stripped the manyard of its corpse and had passed the sail under the mary's bottom in the hope that it would stop the leak this i had partly done as long as the galleon had continued to glide one way then without coming about she had begun to glide the other the ropes had parted and she had dragged the sail after her leaving a broad tarnish on the silver sea for it was broadside that the galleon glided, almost imperceptibly, ever sucking down. She glided as if a lodestone drew her. And, at first, Abel Keeling had thought that it was a lodestone, pulling at her iron, drawing her through the pearly mists that lay like face-cloths through the water and hid at a short distance the tarnish left by the sail. But later he had known that it was no lodestone drawing at her iron. The motion was due must be due to the absolute deadness of the calm in that silent sinister three miles broad waterway with the eye of his mind he saw that lodestone now as he lay against the gun truck all but toppling down the deck soon that would happen again which had happened for five days past he would hear again the chattering of monkeys and the screaming of parrots the mat of green and yellow weeds would creep in toward the merry over the quick silver sea once more the sheer wall of rock would rise and the men would run no the men would not run this time to drop the fenders there were no men left to do so unless bly was still alive perhaps bly was still alive he had walked halfway down the quarter-deck steps a little before the sudden nightfall of the day before had then fallen and lain for a minute dead abel keeling had supposed watching him from his place by the gun truck and had then got up again and tottered forward to the forecastle his tall figure swaying and his long arms waving Abel Keeling had not seen him since. Most likely he had died in the forecastle during the night. If he had not been dead, he would have come aft again for water. At the remembrance of the water, Abel Keeling lifted his head. The strands of lean muscle about his emaciated mouth worked, and he made a little pressure of his sun-blackened hand on the deck, as if to verify its steepness and his own balance. The mainmast was some seven or eight yards away. He put one stiff leg under him and began, seated as he was, to make shuffling movements down the slope. To the mainmast near the belfry was affixed his contrivance for catching water. It consisted of a collar of rope set lower at one side than at the other, but that had been before the massed steve so many degrees away from the zenith, and tallowed beneath. 
the mists lingered later in that gully of a strait than they did on the open ocean, and the collar of rope served as a collector for the dews that condensed on the mast. The drops fell into a small earthen pipkin placed on the deck beneath it. Abel Keeling reached the pipkin and looked into it. It was nearly a third full of fresh water. Good. If Bly, the mate, was dead, so much the more water for Abel Keeling, master of the Mary of the Tower. He dipped two fingers into the pipkin and put them into his mouth. This he did several times. He did not dare to raise the pipkin to his black and broken lips, for dread of a remembered agony. He could not have told how many days ago, when a devil had whispered to him, and he had gulped down the contents of the pipkin in the morning, and for the rest of the day had gone waterless. Again he moistened his fingers and sucked them. Then he lay sprawling against the mast, idly watching the drops of water as they fell. It was odd how the drops formed. Slowly they collected at the edge of the tallow collar, trembled in their fullness for an instant, and fell, another beginning the process instantly. It amused Abel Keeling to watch them. Why, he wondered, were all the drops the same size? What cause and compulsion did they obey that they never varied? And what frail tenuity held the little globules intact? It must be due to some cause. He remembered that the aromatic gum of the wild frankincense, with which they had parceled the seams, had hung on the buckets in great sluggish gouts, obedient to a different compulsion. Oil was different again, and so were juices and balsams. Only quicksilver, perhaps the heavy and motionless sea put him in mind of quicksilver, seemed obedient to no law. Why was it so? Bly, of course, would have had his explanation. It was the hand of God. That sufficed for Bly, who had gone forward the evening before, and whom Abel Keeling now seemed vaguely, and as at a distance to remember, as the deep-voiced fanatic who had sung his hymns as, man by man, he had committed the bodies of the ship's company to the deep. Bly was that sort of man, accepted things without question, was content to take things as they were, and be ready with the fenders when the wall of rock rose out of the opalescent mists. Bly, too, like the water-drops, had his law. That was his and nobody else's. There floated down from some rotten rope up aloft a flake of scurf that settled in the pipkin. Abel Keeley watched it dully as it settled toward the pipkin's rim. When presently he again dipped his fingers into the vessel, the water ran into a little vortex, drawing the flake with it. The water settled again, and again the minute flake determined toward the rim and adhered there, as if the rim had power to draw it. It was exactly so that the galleon was gliding toward the wall of rock. The yellow and green weeds and the monkeys and parrots put out into midwater again, while there had been men to put her out. She had glided to the other wall. One force drew the chip in the pipkin and the ship over the Trent Sea. It was the hand of God, said Bly. Abel Keeling, his mind now noting minute things and now clouded up with torpor, did not at first hear a voice that was quakingly lifted up over by the forecastle, a voice that drew nearer to an accompaniment of swirling water. O thou that Jonas in the fish three days didst keep from pain, which was a figure of thy death and rising up again. It was Bly singing one of his hymns. O thou that Noah kept from flood, and Abram day by day, as he long through Egypt passed, didst guide him in the way. The voice ceased, leaving the pious period uncompleted. Bly was alive, at any rate. Abel Keeling resumed his fitful musing. Yes, that was the law of Bly's life, to call things the hand of God. But Abel Keeling's law was different, no better, no worse, only different. The hand of God that drew chips and galleons must work by some method, and Abel Keeling's eyes were dully on the pipkin again, as if he'd sought the method there. Then conscious thought left him for a space, and when he resumed, it was without obvious connection. Oars, of course, were the thing. With oars, men would laugh at calms, oars that only pinnaces and galleuses now use. Had had their advantages. But oars, which was to say a method, for you could say, if you like, that the hand of God grasped the oar loom as the breath of God filled the sail, oars were antiquated belonged to the past, and meant a throwing over of all that was good and new and a return to fine lines, 
a battle formation abreast to give effect to the shock of the ram and a day or two at sea and then to port again for provisions oars no abel keeling was one of the new men the men who swore by the line ahead the broadside fire of sakers and demi cannon and weeks and months without a landfall perhaps one day the wits of such men as he would devise a craft not oar-driven because oars could not penetrate into the remote seas of the world not sail-driven because men who trusted to sails found themselves in an airless three-mile strait suspended motionless between cloud and water ever gliding to a wall of rock but a ship a ship to noah and his sons with him god spake and said he a covenant set i up with you and your posterity it was bly again wandering somewhere in the waste abel keeling's mind was once more a blank then slowly slowly as the water drops collected on the collar of rope his thought took shape again a galleas no not a galleas the galleas made shift to be two things and was neither this ship that the hand of man should one day make for the hand of god to manage should be a ship that should take and conserve the force of the wind take it and store it as she stored her victuals at rest when she wished going ahead when she wished turning the forces both of calm and storm against themselves for of course her force must be wind stored wind a bag of the winds as the children's tale had it when probably directed upon the water astern, driving it away and urging forward the ship, acting by reaction. She would have a wind-chamber, into which wind would be pumped with pumps. Bly would call that equally the hand of God, this driving force of the ship, of the future, that Abel Keeling dimly foreshadowed as he lay beneath the mainmast in the belfry, turning his eyes now and then from ashy white timbers to the vivid green bronze rust of the bell above him. Bly's face, liver-colored with the sun and ravaged from inwards by the faith that consumed him, appeared at the head of the quarter-deck steps. His voice beat uncontrolledly out. And in the refuge here is no place of refuge to be found, nor in the deep and water course that passeth underground. 2. Bly's eyes were lidded, as if in contemplation of his inner ecstasy. His head was thrown back, and his brows worked up and down tormentedly. His wide mouth remained open as his hymn was suddenly interrupted on a long-drawn note. From somewhere in the shimmering mist the note was taken up, and there drummed and rang and reverberated through the strait a windy, hoarse, and dismal bellow, alarming and sustained. A tremor rang through Bly. Moving like a sightless man, he stumbled forward from the head of the quarter-deck steps, and Abel Keeling was aware of his gaunt figure behind him, taller for the steepness of the deck. As that vast empty sound died away, Bly laughed in his mania. "'Lord, hath the grave's wide mouth a tongue to praise thee? Lo, again—' Again the cavernous sound possessed the air, louder and nearer. Through it came another sound, a slow throb, 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 throb. Again the sound ceased. "'Even Leviathan lifteth up his voice in praise!' Bly sobbed. Abel Keeling did not raise his head. There had returned to him the memory of that day when, before the morning mists had lifted from the strait, he had emptied the pipkin of the water that was the allowance until night should fall again. During that agony of thirst he had seen shapes and heard sounds with other than his mortal eyes and ears, and even in the moments that had alternated with his lightness, when he had known these to be hallucinations, they had come again. He had heard the bells on a Sunday in his own Kentish home, the calling of children at play, the unconcerned singing of men at their daily labor, and the laughter and gossip of the women as they had spread the linen on the hedge or distributed bread upon the platters. These voices had rung in his brain, interrupted now and then by the groans of Bly and of two other men who had been alive then. Some of the voices he had heard had been silent on earth this many a long year, but Abel Keeling, thirst-tortured, had heard them, even as he was now hearing that vacant moaning with the intermittent throbbing that filled the strait with alarm. "'Praise him! Praise him! Praise him!' Bly was calling deliriously. Then a bell seemed to sound in Abel Keeling's ears, and, as if something in the mechanism of his brain had slipped, another picture rose in his fancy— the scene when the Mary of the Tower had put out, to a bravery of swinging bells and shrill fifes, 
and valiant trumpets. She had not been a leper-white galleon then. The scroll-work on her prow had twinkled with gilding. Her belfry and stern galleries and elaborate lanterns had flashed in the sun with gold, and her fighting tops and the war pavests about her waist had been gay with painted coats and stutchins. To her sails had been stitched gaudy ramping lions of scarlet sail, and from her manyard, now dipping in the water, had hung the broad two-tailed pennant with a virgin and child embroidered upon it. Then suddenly a voice about him seemed to be saying, "'And a half-seven, and a half-seven,' and in a twink the picture in Abel Keeling's brain changed again. He was at home again, instructing his son, young Abel, in the casting of the lead from the skiff they had pulled out of the harbour. "'And a half-seven,' the boy seemed to be calling. Abel Keeling's blackened lips muttered, "'Excellently well cast, Abel, excellently well cast. "'And a half-seven, and a half-seven, seven, seven.' Ah, uh, Abel Keeling murmured, "Thy lass was not a clear cast. Give me the line. Thus it should go. Ah, so. Soon you shall sail the seas with me in the merry of the tower. You are already perfect in the stars and the motions of the planets. Tomorrow I will instruct you in the use of the backstaff." For a minute or two he continued to mutter. Then he dozed. When again he came to semi-consciousness, it was once more to the sound of bells at first faint, then louder, and finally becoming a noisy clamor immediately above his head. It was Bly. Bly, in a fresh attack of delirium, had seized the bell lanyard and was ringing the bell insanely. The cord broke in his fingers, but he thrust at the bell with his hand, and again called aloud, "'Upon an harp and an instrument of ten strings, let heaven and earth praise thy name!' He continued to call aloud, and to beat on the bronze-rusted bell. "'Ship ahoy!' What ship's that? One would have said that a veritable ale had come out of the mists, but Abel Keeling knew that those ales that came out of the mists, they came from ships which were not there. Ay, ay, keep a good lookout and have a care of your load manage, he muttered again to his son. But as sometimes a sleeper sits up in his dreams, or rises from his couch and walks, so all of a sudden Abel Keeling found himself on his hands and knees on the deck, looking back over his shoulder. In some deep-seated region of his consciousness, he was dimly aware that the cant of the deck had become more perilous, but his brain received the intelligence and forgot it again. He was looking out into the bright and baffling mists. The buckler of the sun was of a more ardent silver. The sea below it was lost in brilliant evaporation, and between them, suspended in the haze, no more substantial than the vague darknesses that float before dazzled eyes, a pyramidal phantom shape hung. Abel Keeling passed his hand over his eyes, but when he removed it the shape was still there, gliding slowly toward the Mary's quarter. Its form changed as he watched it. The spirit-gray shape that had been a pyramid seemed to dissolve into four upright members, slightly graduated in tallness. That nearest the Mary's stern, the tallest, and that to the left the lowest. It might have been the shadow of the gigantic set of reed pipes on which that vacant, mournful note had been sounded. And as he looked with fooled eyes, again his ears became fooled. Ahoy there! What ship's that? Are you a ship? Here, give me that trumpet! Then a metallic barking. Ahoy there! What the devil are you? Didn't you ring a bell? Ring it again, or blow a blast or something, and go dead slow! All this came, as it were, indistinctly, and through a sort of high singing in Abel Keeling's own ears. Then he fancied a short, bewildered laugh, followed by a colloquy from somewhere between sea and sky. Here, Ward, just pinch me, will you? Tell me what you see there. I want to know if I'm awake. See where? There, on the starboard bow. Stop that ventilating fan. I can't hear myself think. See anything? Don't tell me it's that damned Dutchman. Don't pinch me with that old van der Denken tail. Give me an easy one first. Something about a sea serpent. You did hear that bell, didn't you? Shut up a minute. Listen. Again, Bly's voice was lifted up. This is the covenant that I make. From henceforth nevermore will I again the world destroy with water as before. Bly's voice died away again in Abel Keeling's ears. Oh, my fat Aunt Julia! 
the voice that seemed to come from between sea and sky sounded again. Then it spoke more loudly. I say, it began with careful politeness, if you are a ship, do you mind telling us where the masquerade is to be? Our wireless is out of order, and we haven't heard of it. Oh, you do see it, Ward, don't you? Please, please, tell us what the hell you are. Again, Abel Keeling had moved as a sleepwalker moves. He had raised himself up by the belfry timbers, and Bly had sunk in a heap on the deck. Abel Keeling's movement overturned the pipkin, which raced the little trickle of its contents down the deck and lodged where the still and brimming sea made, as it were, a chain with a carved balustrade of the quarter-deck, one link a still gleaming edge, then a dark baluster, and then another gleaming link. For one moment only Abel Keeling found himself noticing that that which had driven Bly aft had been the rising of the water in the waist as the galleon had settled by the head. The waist was now entirely submerged. Then once more he is absorbed in his dream, its voices, and its shape in the mist, which had again taken the form of a pyramid before his eyeballs. Of course, a voice seemed to be complaining anew, and still through that confused dinning in Abel Keeling's ears, we can't turn a four-inch on it. Of course, Ward, I don't believe in him. Do you hear, Ward? I don't believe in him, I say. Shall I call down to old A.B.? This might interest his scientific skippership. Oh, lower a boat and pull out to it. Into it. Over it. Through it. Look at the chaps crowded on the bobbit yonder. They've seen it. Better not give an order you know won't be obeyed. Abel Keeling, cramped against the antique belfry, had begun to find his dream interesting. For, though he did not know or build, that mirage was the shape of a ship. No doubt it was projected from his brooding on ships of half an hour before, and that was odd. But perhaps, after all, it was not very odd. He knew that she did not really exist, only the appearance of her existed, but things had to exist like that before they really existed. Before the Mary of the Tower had existed, she had been a shape in some man's imagination. Before that, some dreamer had dreamed the form of a ship with oars, and before that, far away in the dawn and infancy of the world, some seer had seen in a vision the raft before man had ventured to push out over the water on his own two planks. And since this shape had rode before Abel Keeling's eyes was a shape in his, Abel Keeling's dream, he, Abel Keeling, was the master of it. His own brooding brain a contrived her, and she was launched upon the illimitable ocean of his own mind. And I will not unmindful be of this, my covenant past, twixt me and you and every flesh, whiles that the world should last. Sang Bly, rapt. But as a dreamer, even in his dream, will scratch upon the wall by his couch some key or word to put him in mind of his vision on the morrow when it has left him, so Abel Keeling found himself seeking some sign to be a proof to those to whom no vision is vouchsafed. Even Bly sought that, could not be silent in his bliss, but lay on the deck there, uttering great passionate amens and praising his maker, as he said, upon an harp and an instrument of ten strings. So with Abel Keeling, it would be the amen of his life to have praised God, not upon a harp, but upon a ship that should carry her own power, that should store wind, or its equivalent, as she stored her victuals, that should be something wrested from the chaos of uninvention and ordered and disciplined and subordinated to Abel Keeling's will. And there she was, that ship-shaped thing of spirit grey, with the four pipes that resembled a phantom organ now broadside and of equal length. And the ghost crew of that ship was speaking again. The interrupted silver chain by the quarter-deck balustrade had now become continuous, and the balusters made an airing bone over their own motionless reflections. The spilt water from the pipkin had dried, and the pipkin was not to be seen. Abel Keeling stood beside the mast, erect as God bade man to go. With his leathery hand he smote upon the bell. He waited for the space of a minute, and then cried, Oi! Ship ahoy! What ship's that? 3. We are not conscious in a dream that we are playing a game, the beginning and end of which are in ourselves. In this dream of Abel Keeling's, a voice replied, Hello, it's found its tongue. Oi there! What are you? 
loudly, and in a clear voice Abel Keeling called, "'Are you a ship?' With a nervous giggle the answer came, "'We are a ship, aren't we, Ward? I hardly feel sure. Yes, of course we're a ship. No question about us. The question is what the dickens you are.' Not all the words these voices used were intelligible to Abel Keeling, and he knew not what it was in the tone of these last words that reminded him of the honour due to the Mary of the Tower, blister white, and at the end of her life as she was, Abel Keeling was still jealous of her dignity. The voice had a youngish ring, and it was not fitting that young chin should be wagged about his galleon. He spoke curtly. "'You that spoke! Are you the master of that ship?' "'Also the watch!' The words floated back. The captain's below. Then send for him. It is with masters that masters hold speech, Abel Keeling replied. He could see the two shapes, flat and without relief, standing on a high, narrow structure with rails. One of them gave a low whistle and seemed to be fanning his face, but the other rumbled something into a sort of funnel. Presently the two shapes became three. There is a murmuring as of a consultation, and then suddenly a new voice spoke. At its thrill and tone a sudden tremor ran through Abel Keeling's frame. He wondered what response it was that the voice found in the forgotten recesses of his memory. Ahoy! seemed to call this new yet faintly remembered voice. What's all this about? Listen, we're His Majesty's destroyer, Sea Pink. Out of Devonport last October, nothing particular the matter with us. Now who are you? The Mary of the Tower, out of the port of Rye on the day of St. Anne, and only two men. A gasp interrupted him. Out of where? That voice that so strangely moved Abel Keeling said unsteadily, while Bly broke into groans of renewed rapture. Out of the port of Rye in the county of Sussex, Nay, give ear, else I cannot make you hear me while this man's spirit and flesh wrestle so together. Ahoy, are you gone? For the voices had become a low murmur, and the ship's shape had faded before Abel Keeling's eyes. Again and again he called. He wished to be informed of the disposition and economy of the wind chamber. The wind chamber, he called, in an agony lest the knowledge almost within his grasp should be lost. I would know about the wind chamber. Like an echo there came back the words, uncomprehendingly uttered. The wind chamber? The driver the vessel, perchance tis not wind. A steel bow that is bent also conserveth force, the force you stir, to move at will through calm and storm. Can you make out what it's driving at? Oh, we shall all wake up in a minute. Quiet, I have it. The engines. I want to know about our engines. We'll be wanting to see our papers presently. Rye port. Let's see what it can make of this. Oi there, came the voice to Abel Keeling, a little more strongly, as if a shifting wind carried it, and speaking faster and faster as it went on. Not wind, but steam, do you hear? Steam, 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 and eight yarrow water tube boilers. S-T-E-A-M, steam. Got it? And we've twin screw triple expansion engines, indicated horsepower four thousand, and we can do four hundred thirty revolutions per minute. Savvy? Is there anything your phantom hood would like to know about our armament? Abel Keeling was muttering fretfully to himself, and annoyed him that words in his own vision should have no meaning for him. How did words come to him in a dream that he had no knowledge of when wide awake? The Sea Pink, that was the name of this ship. But a pink was long and narrow, low cargued and square built aft. And as for our armament, the voice of the tones that so profoundly troubled Abel Keeling's memory continued. We've two revolving white head torpedo tubes, three six pounders on the upper deck, and that's a twelve pounder forward there by the conning tower. I forgot to mention that we're nickel steel with a coal capacity of sixty tons and most damnably placed bunkers. And that thirty and a quarter knots is about our top. Can I come on board? But the voice was speaking still more rapidly and feverishly, as if to fill a silence with no matter what, and the shape that was uttering it was straining forward anxiously over the rail. Oh, but I'm glad this happened in the daylight, another voice was muttering. I wish I was sure it was happening at all, poor old Spook. 
I suppose it would keep its feet if a deck was quite vertical. Think she'll go down or just melt? Kind of go down, without wash. Listen, here's the other one now, for Bly was singing again. For, Lord, thou notes our nature such, if we great things obtain, and in the getting of the same do feel no grief or pain. We little do esteem thereof, but hardly brought to pass, a thousand times we do esteem more than the other was. But, oh, look, look, look at the other. Oh, I say, wasn't he a grand old boy? Look. For transfiguring Abel Keeling's form as a prophet's form is transfigured in the instant of his rapture, flooding his brain with the white eureka light of perfect knowledge, that for which he in his dream had been at a standstill had come. He knew her, the ship of the future. As if God's finger had bitten her lines into his brain, he knew her as those already sinking into the grave know things miraculously, completely, accepting life's impossibilities with a nodded, Of course. From the ardent mouths of her eight furnaces to the last drip from her lubricators, from her bedplates to the breeches of her quick firers, he knew her, read her gauges, thumbed her bearings, gave the rangers from her range finders, and lived the life he lived who was in command of her and he would not forget on the morrow, as he had forgotten on many morrows, for at last he had seen the water about his feet, and knew that there would be no morrow for him in this world. And even in that moment, with but a sand or two to run in his glass, indomitable, insatiable, dreaming dream on dream, he could not die until he knew more. He had two questions to ask, and a master question, and but a moment remained. Sharply his voice rang out, Ho oh, there! This ancient ship! The Mary of the Tower cannot steam thirty and a quarter knots, but she can yet sail the waters. What more does your ship? Can she soar above them as the fowls of the air soar? Oh, Lord, he thinks he were an aeroplane. No, she can't. Can you dive, even as the fishes to the deep? No. Those are submarines. We aren't a submarine. But Abel Keeling waited for no more. He gave an exulting chuckle. Ha, ha! thirty knots, and but on the face of the waters. No more than that. Oh, now my ship, the ship I see as a mother sees full-grown, the child she has but conceived. My ship, I say. Oh, my ship shall. Below there, trip that gun. The cry came suddenly and alertly, as a muffled sound came from below, and an ominous tremor shook the galleon. Watch out, our guns are breaking loose below. That's our finish. Trip that gun and double breach the others. Abel Keeling's voice rang out as if there had been any to obey him. He had braced himself within the belfry frame, and then in the middle of the next order his voice suddenly failed him. His ship shape, that for the moment he had forgotten, rode once more before his eyes. This was the end, and his master question, apprehension for the answer to which he was now torturing his face and well-nigh bursting his heart, was still unasked. Ho! Oh, he that spoke with me, the master, he cried in a voice that ran high. Is he there? Yes, yes, came the other voice across the water, sick with suspense. Hey, be quick! There was a moment in which hoarse cries from many voices, a heavy thud and rumble on wood, and a crash of timbers and a gurgle and a splash were indescribably mingled. The gun under which Abel Keeling had lain had snapped her rotten breechings and plunged down the deck, carrying by his unconscious form with it. The deck came up vertical, and for one instant longer Abel Keeling clung to the belfry. "'I cannot see her face!' he screamed. "'But me seems your voice is a voice I knew. What is your name?' In a torn sob, the answer came across the water. Keeling! Abel Keeling! Oh, my God! And Abel Keeling's cry of triumph, that mounted to a victorious, Huzzah! was lost in the downward plunge of the Mary of the Tower, that left the strait empty save for the sun's fiery blaze and the last smoke-like evaporation of the mists. End of chapter 2 Phantas.